this morning, and I know y'all y'all say, you know what? It might be 25 degrees, but I'm going to church this morning. Amen, man. You know what, man? I, I woke up and I looked at my thing and said, 25 degrees. I thought about Dorothy. I said, Lord, I got a feeling I'm not in Florida anymore. You know? You know, like <laughs> Amen. Amen. But you you know what, Lord? We thank God for the sunshine. And we thank God for the cold weather. Because guess what? You can feel it. You can enjoy it. You can go outside and walk in it and be active in it. That is a blessing from the great God of heaven. And we dare not, um, ne dare not thank God for all it is that he has done in our lives. As always, we're thankful for those of you that are watching us via live stream on this morning. God bless you. We're glad to have you in our midst here on this morning. And we pray that you will follow along with us, be blessed by those things that are said here on this morning. Um, as has already been stated, we'll be in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And we'll be reading verses 1 through 7 for our consideration um, on this morning. And if y'all say amen real good, I won't be here too long. So, now, Brother Smith, we were just good. And you over here, the first one to highlight it, it be your people. It be your people. First one to highlight it, amen. Amen. We thank God for our being here on today. Second Samuel chapter 12. I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. Get set my hand, my feet, I'm talking about what he's done for me. I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. And I get joy, joy, just thinking about. And I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. Get set my hand, my feet, I'm talking about what he's done for me. I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. And oh, how I wonder, just when my soul looks back, well, I ever made it through my sinful, wicked path. I did everything I thought I wanted to do, and it brought me down. But God reached out and held me, and I'm here to tell you now that I get joy, joy, just thinking about. And I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. Get set my hand, my feet, I'm talking about what he's done for me. I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. And I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. And I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. Get set my hand, my feet, I'm talking Talking about what he's done for me. I get joy, joy, thinking about what he's done for me. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 12, and I'm going to begin reading at verse number one. And you dare say, I'm that preacher. Amen. Amen. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. It grew up together with him and his children. It ate of his food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom as if it was like a daughter to him. And behold, a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one meal for this wayfaring man. He took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has did this will surely die. Don't speak too soon. And he said, restore fourfold the lamb because he did this thing because he had no pity. Then David said to Nathan, you are the man. You are the man. And I want to talk with you for a few moments about particularly verse number four. And it says, and there came a traveler and a traveler came to the rich man. 
That's what we'll get our message from on this morning. As we know on these past two weeks that we have dealt with subjects that dealt with our mind and those things that we keep in our mind and how it's not beneficial for us to have a clouded mind because if we have a clouded mind and our mind is being pulled in various directions, then we're not fine that we don't have too much time to give to God and the things that God has called for us to do. But I want to stay along with the same theme here on this morning because everything in this story pivots and changes when a traveler shows up. I got to give y'all a topic, don't I? Okay. Watch out for the traveler. Watch out for the traveler. And I want to talk to you about what this traveler represents in our life. The traveler took something from the poor man that was precious. And he'll take something from you if you'll allow him and feed to him. He said, beware of the traveler. What caused the saint to become a sinner? What caused this man who was so powerful and so anointed to somehow become a weakling? It didn't happen overnight, church. It didn't happen in a week's time. He was 50 years of age, 30, when he first became king of Israel, and he reigned for 20 years, and for 20 years, Satan had been watching him. Our enemy church watches what we smile at. Our enemy watches what we react to. I marvel at the patience of hell. You know, hell is very patient. Hell don't take you down quick. It just watches and probes and watches. And the enemy watched this man by the name of David. You see, David never considered how far one thought is able to take you. One evil thought transpired into a look, and the look led into lust, and the lust led to him being lost. And eventually, it all started with the evil mindset. It all started when he let the traveler in. There came a thought to him one day when the kings went to walk. He was at home in his palace, and he looked out, and he saw a woman taking a bath. And that's the traveler coming by. You can't help it if you see something. You're not blind. You live in a natural world. You have eyes that see and you have ears that hear. Amen, church? You notice the world and the things that you are in. But it's when you don't just let the things happen and you see them, but when you react to the things that are going on around you. You need to let those things keep on traveling. But church, when you open the door and invite that kind of stuff into your life and then you start feeding the traveler, you start slaying the lamb in your own house to feed the traveler the bad thoughts, the evil thoughts. A lamb is dying in you when you feed the wrong thoughts. And it wasn't that just he saw her. If at that moment he would have said, Lord, I need to look the other way. And I need to go here. And I need to sing a song of praise. And I need to bring my harp out. I need to get some scripture out. I need to get my mind right. But he started feeding the thought. He began to ask questions. If you really read the story, he questioned, who is that woman? Well, first of all, David, you're a married man. So what difference does it make who she is? You shouldn't be looking at her Facebook. You shouldn't be on her Twitter. You shouldn't be trying to find her Snapchat. You shouldn't be on her Instagram. It ain't got nothing to do with you. You're a married man. And then he not only invited her, he sent for her. I'm sure he probably thought she needed prayer. <laughs> oh, she just lost her husband. She needs somebody to talk to. She needs some counseling. Send for her. You are a married man. Why are you sending for her? What is he doing? Feeding the thought. 
He's feeding the thought. He never dreamed. He never even considered how far an evil thought could take him. But it all began with an evil thought. Listen to this, church. Little did he know that before long, he would be an adulterer. He would become a murderer. He would be a liar. He would bear false witness. He would dishonor his parents. He would steal. He would kill. He would covet. He broke all ten commandments with his sin. And do you know how he did it? It all started with a simple thought. Yeah, he saw it. He should have turned away. He, you can't help it if a bird flies over your head. But you don't need to let him build a nest on your head and hatch eggs in your head. Y'all get what I'm saying? There's a difference. And it's not wrong to be tempted. Because you're going to be tempted in life. Even Jesus was tempted. But it's when you open the door and you start feeding the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, feeding depression, feeding hopelessness, feeding negativism. When you start feeding that stuff, it starts killing the lamb. The Bible said that David took for himself in 2 Samuel 5 and 13 more concubines and more wives. See, kings were forbidden to have too much of three things. God said, if you're a king in Deuteronomy, I think it's in chapter 17, he said, you're not to have too many horses. I don't know why he just said, don't have too many horses. You're not to have too much gold. I don't know why. And then he said, you're not to have too many wives. Well, David, after a great battle, slew his war horses as a sacrifice to God. He didn't have a problem with the horses. David, after he made millions and billions of dollars, took all that money and gave it to Solomon so he could build a temple. So he didn't have a problem with the gold. But he had a problem with women. And I dare not allow you to sit there and be judgmental about David because David's issue may not be your issue, but I came to put you on notice this morning that you have an issue. You have something in your life that you are dealing with. It's something that tempts you. It's something that's pulling at you, that's pulling for your mind, that's pulling for your attention, and you got to be ready to let that stuff alone. You've heard it said, you can't live wrong and die right. Temptation is the devil looking through the keyhole. Yielding is when you open the door and let him in. There are restless spirits, church, that are gripping men and women in their homes and their families and young people. And when that restless spirit comes upon you, the enemy will send the traveler. And if you start feeding the wrong thoughts, the evil thoughts, the wicked thoughts, what are you thinking on? The Bible said, when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, what does it bring? It brings forth death. Notice the threefold step to destruction. When lust has conceived, where is it conceived? In the man. It brings forth sin. How? Through the deeds of the body. So it, pay, it matters the thoughts that you have in your mind. It matters the things that you are thinking on because what is in your mind is eventually going to show up in your actions. What are you thinking about? What are you toying with? Many people are doing it, but you ain't got to do it. You don't have to toy with it. You're constantly thinking about stuff, contemplating about stuff. You got private thoughts that lead to public actions. Mercy, mercy. What you do in private.
private and think in private, it's a matter of time before it manifests itself in public. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7 said, let the wicked man forsake his wickedness. Forsake it. Listen to this. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts. I think it's so significant that God says, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to not just stop the wicked stuff, but let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Church, one of the signs of an unrighteous person is what kind of thoughts you continuously have in your mind. What are you feeding? Are you feeding the lust of the flesh? What kind of music are you listening to? What kind of stuff are you listening at? What kind of things are in control of your life? Are you feeding the traveler? You're not sending him on down the road. It's not wrong again to be tempted, church, but it's wrong when you open the door and you start feeding that thought. Look at your neighbor and tell him you got to get a grip on this thing. The Bible said that we got to take our thoughts captive. You got to lock those things up. You got to bring those things under subjection. He tells us in his word, he said, I'll keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on what? Your problems, the bills that you got to pay, the people on your job that's giving you a hard time, the thoughts that you have in your mind about things that happened long ago. He said, no, I'll keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. You take captive the thoughts of the enemy and the vain imagination. You don't sit around and let the enemy just fill your mind with trash and filth. You take authority over that. Even when somebody calls your phone telling you trash and filth. Do I sit there and listen and try to get all the information that I can get? Or do I say, you know what, I appreciate you calling me and being willing to inform me about this, but I'm at a different place in my walk with God right now, and where I'm trying to get with God, I ain't got no time to be a busybody, I ain't got no time to be in nobody else's business, I ain't got no time to worry about what nobody else got going on, I got to save myself, I got to work on myself, I got to work out my own soul salvation with fear. Jesus said, the prince of the world comes and finds nothing in me. If the enemy can't get nothing in you, church, he can't get you to do the things that he wants you to do. He has to first get it into you before he gets you to do it. So it ain't no reason you going around here saying the devil made you do it. You did it because it was already in you. Well, I don't know why I said that. It was already in you. I don't know why I handled it like that. It was already in you. There's nothing that's just going to poop pop out that wasn't already present in your heart. The Bible says that it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. He has to first get it into your church. Some of you have your mind, some of us, I'll say, I like to include everybody, I don't leave myself out. Some of us have our mind more on things than we do Jesus. We are not, we are not doing for the kingdom of God, we are doing for the kingdom of thingsdom. It's a new word added to the dictionary, thingsdom. We are prisoners of plenty. But the challenge in the age in which we live is to love the Lord your God, the Bible says, not just with some of yourself, but with all of your mind. Come on, somebody. With all of your soul and with all of your strength. Isn't that an interesting verse? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and with your mind. Do you really love God this morning? I 
I know you love him with your heart. I know you wouldn't be here this morning. You wouldn't have braced the cold weather if you didn't love the Lord this morning. But are you loving him with all of your mind? Are you loving him with the six inches that are between this ear and this ear? Are you loving him, church, with all of your mind? The biggest battle that you will ever face, church, again, is not out here. It's between this ear and this ear. The area right here will determine victory or defeat in your life. This area right here, church, will determine whether you are pure or whether you are unpure, whether you are clean or whether you are not clean. And I have to have this area right if I really love Jesus. I can't have a carnal mind and claim Christ. To be carnally minded, Paul said, is death. It's death to your dreams. It's death to your business. It's death to your integrity. It's death to your character, church, to be carnally minded. Are you a carnally minded person? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, come on, everybody, help me preach. Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, think on these things. Again, are you loving the Lord with all of your mind? If you are, then that's how you do it. If there's anything good, invite it in and feed it. Feed it. If there's anything wholesome, invite it in and feed it. If there's anything worthy of praise and a good report, invite it in. You want to get beyond your depression? Don't invite depression and feed it. Invite victory into your house. We are not called to be a bunch of depressed people. We are called to be the head. Come on, somebody, and not the tail. To be above only and not beneath. To be the limber and not the borrower. Oh, I know what the doctor said, but I also know what Jesus said. By his stripes. Not I I might be. I am already healed. By his stripes. Invite that into your life. It matters what you feed yourself when you're going through your going throughs in life. They teach church in the day and age that we live in that we came from little muddy drops of water called protoplasm that became a tadpole. And that tadpole got wiggling in its tail and it kept wiggling until it became a fish with fins. Now, I don't don't believe that, but that's what they say. Then a storm came and blew him out of the water and he started flipping around on the sand until he knocked his scales off. And when his scales fell off, he grew four legs and started going around eating. And there's more fruit up in the top of the tree than it is down. So he stood up on his hind legs more, and so therefore, he stands erect now. Then he started nibbling on the grass, and can you believe it? A cold spell came and froze the entire world, and he grew some hair. And he noticed there was some fruit up in the tree that wasn't on the ground. So he moved up into the top of the tree and he grew a tail. And he hooked that tail around the branches and became a monkey. And then from monkey, eventually through acclimation and evolution, some of the hair fell off. He lost his tail, thank God, we ain't got no hair. And now, he at the zoo. And that's, that's how they say we got here. My Bible said that in the beginning, God, not man, God made the heavens and the earth. 
And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It takes more faith to believe what I just said than it does to believe in God. A whole, you church, the professor got up in his school one day and he was in class and he was going off about what I just said. And he was just up there mocking the Bible and creation and all that stuff and how we as Christians are just so gullible and how ignorant we are. And I'm going to tell you something. The man was going on and he was just going and telling his story and there was one boy in his class that listened to the professor mock the Bible and teach about evolution. And when he finished, he said, sir, can I make a comment? He said, sure. He said, I wrote a poem and I really want you to hear it. He said, yes. He said, in the beginning... It was a microbe beginning to begin. And then it was a tadpole with its tail tucked in. And then it was a monkey hanging from a tree. But now it's a professor with a PhD. I'm so glad, church, that I believe that I'm chosen, that I am the called of God, that I am favored by God, that I am the anointed of God, that God so loved me that he sent his son for me and that he has a plan for my life. Does anybody believe that this morning? I know the truth. Romans 1 and 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Nor were they thankful to him because they were futile with what? Their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Changed the glory of an incorruptible God into the image made in a corruptible man. Church, everybody say, God, don't give up on me. God, don't give up on me. Church, the danger of letting thoughts that are evil, and can I be real with you? When we start feeding stuff into our lives, because we have to get to the place where we are honest with ourselves. And as we look in the text and we see people like David, it's not good enough for us to just sit there and read about what they went through and then for us to judge them based off the decision that they make but it's their church as a mirror so you can see yourself in what it is that they were going through so when you start feeding the stuff in your mind when you start feeding yourself trash and filth and ungodliness it is their church that the enemy comes in the Bible says that God gave some people up to uncleanliness in their lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worship and serve the creature more than the creator. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women, the Bible says, exchange the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, the man leaving the natural use of the woman burned in lust one for another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. Listen to this. And even as they did not like to retain God in their minds or knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate man. King James says like that, a reprobate man. What does that mean? Look at the next verse. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, violence, proud back, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving of the young generation, unforgiving, unmerciful. Amen. Knowing the righteous judgment of God, the Bible says they gave themselves over. And I'm glad that he gave a list. I'm glad he didn't just put one thing right there because some of us can say, well, that don't fit me. 
Well, he said, if you keep on reading, after a while, one of these gonna come down your street. It's not only gonna come down your street, it's gonna come up in the driveway. It's gonna walk up on your front porch. It's gonna knock on your door, and you're gonna have to come face to face. Church, you got to deal with the anthill before it becomes a mountain. You know something about farming. Only way you ate that, that plant growing up, you can, you, you can shape them up while it's young. Yeah. But when it gets old, ain't nothing you can do with it. It's just going to be big. It's just going to be leaning. However it is, church, don't allow the things that you are struggling with. Whether you are struggling with hatred in your heart towards somebody. Maybe you have a lust situation that you have going on. Some of you may be addicted to certain things in this life. You got to deal with those things while you have the opportunity. Don't try to sweep those things under the rug and lock them in a closet. Thinking just because you ain't thinking about it that it ain't don't show up anymore. That's why the Bible says, let any man that thinks he stands take heed unless he fall. Because you walking around talking about what you won't do, what you would have did, and what you won't ever do. But you won't know until you are in the situation, until you are in the rock and the hard place. You won't know what you will do. Oh, well, David ought to be ashamed of himself. He knew he was married, and he went out there with that. Oh, you talk about David, but if you would have been David. And David was a man. So if a man, after God's own heart, struggled, don't you try to tell me that you don't have no struggles. Don't you try to tell me, preacher, everything is all right. I'm good. I'm just sitting here. I got my ticket in my hand, and I'm just waiting on Jesus to come. But you recognize some of us in here can be honest and say, preacher, I struggle on a day-to-day -day basis. Preacher, some days I feel like I have more down days than I have up days. But I can testify today, and I can say that God has delivered me out of the snare. God has delivered me out of the pit. God has delivered me from the snare of the fowler and everything that the devil sought to do against me. I went through it, but now praise God, I'm on the other side of it. Look at somebody and say, I got some issues. I got some. Yeah, but this, and I got some, I got some issues. Pray for me. The Bible said of Lot that he, the Bible says, was vexed in his spirit by what he heard and by what he saw. Do you ever get vexed in your spirit? How do you ever get vexed in your spirit? by what you hear and by what you see? Do you get disturbed at anything you see or hear? Can you hear anything and it not bother you? Can you see anything and it not convict you? Esau, the Bible said, yeah, Esau, the Bible says, was a profane man. The word profane means fruit thoroughfare. His mind, meaning, was open to anything. Is your mind open to anything? Do you have anything that says, I need to turn it off? Do you have anything that says, I don't want to hear that, that's wrong? Because whatever you are feeding yourself, you're feeding the traffic. And he's going to take the lamb. It's going to cost you something. I'm sure you've seen it. Says sin is like a credit card. Enjoy now. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. So enjoy now. She's going to pay for it later. With interest. So that means, you just, you just told me that sin always costs you more 
than you ever intended to pay. Sin always going to keep you longer than you ever expected to stay. Y'all, sin is just like some good tater chips. You can't have just one. Y'all ever had somebody, you ask them for some chips, and they come out with one chip, like, man, are you, what am I going to do with one chip? I need more than one. And when you have sin in your life, when you welcome the traveler into your home, when you welcome sin into your home, church, it's going to take up residence. Some of us need to go home today pleading the blood as soon as we walk through our, the doors of our house. So, oh, you need to be walking through your house, devil. I don't know your intentions. I don't know your plan. But as of this day, I want to let you know I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm standing upon the word of God. Sickness, you ain't got no room over here. Depression, you ain't got no room over here. Evil thoughts, you ain't got no room over here. This is the Lord's habitation. Lord, he is living on the inside of me. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's how bold faith talks. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 27. Can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? Can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned. What is that saying? Do you think just because you have those things in your life that they are not going to cause you some type of pain? Some type of discomfort? Some type of hurt is going to take place because you have those things present in your life, church? It goes on to say, will his clothes not be consumed? Church, before the devil can get you to do anything, He's going to first of all get in your head. Yes. 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 Some of y'all can say, preacher, I believe you're right because he stopped by my house this morning. <laughs> he told me it was too cold to go to church. Amen. Yeah. Preacher, some of y'all can say, preacher, he came when the offering plate came around. He told me that I had other things that I wanted to do and that was nothing that I needed. And if I put any money in that, it was going to withhold from the things that I wanted to do. Preacher, you can say he's here right now because he got all kinds of things in my mind. And I can't really pay attention to what you're saying because my mind is over here and my mind is over there. You got to bring those thoughts under subjection, church. This is the Lord's time. Yes. This is the Lord's day. Yes. Well, I got problems. Guess what? They're going to be waiting on you when you get out of here. Yes. I got issues. Guess what? They're going to be waiting on you when you get out of here. But it takes something for the blessed child of God to understand, preacher, I have good days and I have bad days. Preacher, I have days when I'm standing tall. I have days when I feel like I'm laying flat on the ground. It takes a child of God like that to understand, as the Bible said, that many aren't the afflictions of the righteous, but, somebody said, but, the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. I thank God for a but God in every situation. You thought I was going down, but God. You thought it was the end, but God. You thought I was going to roll over, but God. You thought I was going to throw my hands up, Make a way. Some of y'all just say, preacher, I don't know how he makes a way. I just know he makes a way. Because the doctor told me one thing, but God did another. But God. The enemy comes for no beneficial purpose. He comes to steal, to kill and destroy. You know, he gonna be waiting on some of us as soon as we leave out of here and you get in your vehicle and you go wherever you going. 
just that you just got out of a wonderful worship experience and you're riding high uh -huh. off of the experience that you had. Somebody calling you with some kind of trash. Somebody calling you with some kind of garbage that they want to lay off on you. You get home, stuff happening at the house. This don't want to work. That don't want to work. You got this going on. You got that going on. And after a while, because let me tell you, church, I don't care how much faith you claim that you have. I don't care how strong you say that you are in God. Everybody got their limits on the thing that they are able to handle. Everybody got their limits on the things that they are able to go through. Everybody can handle everything. And that's why you need the Lord. That's why they would say, you got to run to that rock that is higher than I. You got to run to Jesus. And again, church, this right here is where the real war is taking place. Because before you ever act on anything, it's already residing in your heart. The heart can be a tough thing to deal with. Especially when you can't tell the difference between where your heart is leading you and where your feelings are leading you. That's a whole different sermon for a different day. But your feelings... If you're not careful, we'll get you in trouble. Because feelings are just like the seasons. They change. Depending on what's going on. You know, some folks some folk love preaching of the word of God until they come to their door. Until they come and take a seat at their table and they start eating and you know, and you know, and whatever, until they have to look in the mirror at it. They enjoy it. Church. The war is going on, and it's not going to be won by bullets and guns. Church, and as we dealt, we're going through spiritual warfare on a day-to-day -day basis. And the devil, again, has come to kill, to steal, and destroy. But before he can do anything in the natural, he got to get in your mind. That's why you can't get focused. That's why every time you make a step forward and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, it seems like everything in the handbasket come out to stop you from doing what it is that you want to do. Because just like the Lord knows that you are making goals and you are trying to do things, Satan knows as well. And his entire purpose, his entire intention is to keep you from being where it is that God wants you. So, today I want us to come to the realization. I know, I know, you may not necessarily be able to identify with David and his struggle and what he went through. But you got a struggle. You remember when he told us, he said that you can speak to this mountain. And it shall be removed and nothing shall be impossible unto you. He didn't say the mountain. This mountain. Everybody in here has a this mountain. I'm not talking about nobody else's struggle and what nobody else is going through, but everybody has their own this mountain. Everybody. Whether you got a lion spirit, that's your mountain. Whether you're dealing with lust, that's your mountain. You're addicted to pornography, guess what? That may be your mountain. You don't like nobody. That may be your mountain. You don't know how to talk to nobody. That just may be your mountain. Can't stay faithful to God. It just may be your mountain. But you got to take on the spirit of Caleb. Give me my mountain. For I am well able to conquer it. God will not allow you, and you know this also well, to deal with anything that you are not able to handle. Amen. Amen. It would have never got to you if you couldn't handle it. Oh, Come on now. It would have never made it to your address if you weren't able to handle it. But the very fact that you are dealing with the situation is proof evidence of the fact that you have what it takes to handle it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. you have what it takes, church. 
You have what it takes to handle the situation. So you today, take control over your mind. Take control over your thoughts. And even, you got to pay attention because even when you catch yourself beginning to think of, no, nah, I bring myself under subjection. No, nah, Satan, the Lord rebuke. I'm not going to think about that because that is not where I want to be at this moment. Why is anybody that's trying to go forward going to continue to be looking back? You ever seen that little message on your mirror? Say, objects in the mirror. Maybe closer than they appear. And the reason you don't want to keep looking back on stuff is because it may have taken you a long time to get away from it. But it don't take too long for you to go right back into what you just got out of. Take control, church, over you. Bring yourself under subjection. And the thing is, you're not going to be able to accomplish that in and of yourself and of your own strength. You're going to have to ask the almighty God of heaven yeah. to be present in your yeah. life yeah. and to work with you yeah. to cause those say, Lord, I know I may not be where I want to be at this moment, but Lord, I want you to work on me. Lord, I want you to shape me. Lord, I want you to bring me to the potter's wheel and I want you to shape me, God. I want you to work on me. If you see any imperfections, Lord, I want you to work on me. If you see any place that I lack, Lord, I want you to work on me. If I'm leaning, Lord, give me strength on that side. If I find myself going through, I need you to be God in my situation. So, whatever you're dealing with and whatever struggle has decided that it wanted to take root in your mind, today, we're taking control of our mind. We're taking control of our thoughts and the things that we allow to occupy our mind. Yeah. You, you know, if you can be having a good day, things going well, oh, day's just been so good. It don't take but one negative thing to happen. And your whole day is just thrown off course. It might not have been nothing, but you was trying to go through one room and go through the other and shut the door and hit your toe. And all of a sudden, oh, oh, Lord, oh, 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 I'm going through. Not always the mountain that causes us to stumble. Sometimes it's the little mole here that trips us up and causes us to stumble. But whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're struggling with, I trust and I know that God is able to help you. Not necessarily to bring you out of it, but he's good enough to grace you, to be able to sustain you while you are going through it. Because some of y'all can say, preacher, I remember a time in my life where I experienced certain things and I prayed and I begged God. Any of y'all know what it's like to beg God? Yes, Any of y'all know what it's like to wrestle with God? Yes, to tap to tarry with God? Some of y'all say, preacher, I did that. And preacher, you know what? He never did what I asked him to do. But today I can say, he'll show sure enough make a way for you to get through it. And he'll make a way for you, my brother, you, my sister, this morning. He will make a way for you to escape what it is that's hounding you on this morning. Beloved, if you are here on this morning, you don't have to be imprisoned by your thoughts. You don't have to be haunted by the things that have taken root in your mind. But if you would trust God, and if you will surrender, not part of yourself, but your total self, that's what, again, we're talking about, loving the Lord with all of your soul, with all of your heart, with all of your mind. When you give it all to God, can I tell you what? He's going to give you his all. Yeah, yeah. But this is my thing. You're not just going to be able to sit there where you are and expect God to come and pick you up right there. You need to meet him halfway down the road. Yeah, yeah. We can't expect him to meet us all the way, all the time. You're going to have to get up. If you have faith after a while, faith says, I'm not going to lay here, but I'm going to get back up. And I must return to my father's house. I got to go back. I got to get up. You can get up even on this morning, church. 
And sometimes we can get in the state because of certain things that have taken root in our mind and not only taken root in our mind, but they have not produced themselves in our actions. Sometimes we can be so ashamed of the things that have happened and we can be so embarrassed by the things that are taking place that we shy away from repentance. That we shy away from asking God to help us with those things. But can I tell you, if you ask him, God will provide it for you. How many of y'all know David was right when he said, I never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging for bread. They keep talking about inflation, but can I tell you what? Stuff going to keep going up, and it's going to go up, and it's going to go down. But can I tell you what? The good God that we serve going to make sure you got gas in your gas tank. He going to make sure you got milk in your refrigerator. If you got to go spit, I got to come out there and use one of your cows and give me some milk. And look, if I got to go and give me some chickens and put it in the backyard to give me some eggs, guess what? The Lord is going to provide everything that I need. God did not bring you all of the way, every step of the way, just to leave you by yourself. But he promised you, I'll be with you. He'll be with you this morning, my brother, my sister. Don't be haunted, don't be held down by your thoughts, by past actions, but come to a place to relinquish that to God and trust God to bring you through it. If you are here on this morning, beloved, even for those of you that are watching us at this time, and you at this time don't have a saving relationship with God, you don't know him as your Lord and as your Savior, we want to invite you to Jesus here on this morning. I, I can tell you what, if Joseph R. Biden were to send you an invite on this morning, that invite that he sent you wouldn't be nothing to the invite that I'm about to extend unto you today. There was one day, Elder Dennis and I, they're on the coast of Caesarea Philippi and they were out there and Jesus came up on the scene and he went up to a man that was the name Simon he said whom do men say that I the son of man am and he said that some say thou art John the Baptist and others Elias or one of the other Old Testament prophets but he said whom do you say that I the son of man am and he said thou art the Christ the son of the living God he said blessed art thou Simon Barjona for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you but my father which is in heaven and I say to you that thou art Peter and upon this rock I'll build my church my is a possessive pronoun am I right that serves ownership my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it even in this day and time that we live in, with everybody talking about Hebrew Israelites and everybody talking about Islam and, you know, Bishmilel, Rahman, and Rahim, they talking about all that good stuff and they saying all these good things. Can I tell you that one of these days, I don't care if you're a Buddhist, I don't care if you're a Jew, I don't care if you're a Muslim, I don't care if you're a Hindu, I don't care what your religious creed is. One day, you got to stand before an almighty God. You got to stand before the living God and say, you are the one God. You are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You got to stand before him. Don't let these YouTube videos fool you. Don't let people that can't combine a sentence confuse you. He is alive and well. And he is still in the soul saving business yeah and he wants to save your soul even on this morning the bible lets us know that god is not willing that any but god wants all of us to come to repentance he wants all of us and i want to square up this confusion i said i got a message the other day from a lady and she said that, why do y'all put so much emphasis on a name? What is it that's in a name and identifying with a name? Well, can I tell you, if I were to go down to the bank and I had a check and I wanted to cash it and the name on there was Bruce Williams, can I tell you, after I gave them my identification, I would not be able to cash the check because it did not belong to me. If I were to, if 
I were to go and I were to purchase something, I give those people my identification and they look at the name, I am not going to be able to handle it. The reason that Marissa's name is no longer Phyllis but is now Peterson is because now we are one. She is my bride and I am the bridegroom. And after Jesus shed his blood on the cross of Calvary and he died for the sin of all men and women, boys and girls, you are now a part of the bride of Christ. You are a part of the church of Christ, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And can I tell you one day, God is going to come back for the bride and he ain't coming back but for one bride. To say anything else would, say, would be to say that your God is a pimp. To say anything else, that is what you mean. But he has come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. And I know times have changed. I know we ain't no longer walking, we ain't no longer riding around with a horse and buggy. We got cars now. I know no, nobody is, has an ice box or ice chest anymore. You got refrigerators. Some of our refrigerators got TVs on them. They can play music. We, we've upgraded. We've moved up in the world. But can I tell you, ain't nothing upgrading about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word of God is going to be the same yesterday, today, and even forevermore. And it's that same word that's going to judge you in the last day. So I'm going to trust God's word. I'm going to take him at his word. And if he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. You take that check down to the bank and you cash it. Because God's word ain't going to return void. So if you're here today, even for those that you're watching, I don't want y'all to get the misconception. Y'all are just a part of this as we are this morning. And even for those that you're watching us, you may be in another state or another place at this time. I want you to reach out to us and let us know you're not saved. You're not a member of the body of Christ. I know somebody around you that can help you become a member of the body of Christ. Not tomorrow, but today. You can have your soul saved today. And that's what I love about the body of Christ. We ain't got no set date on whether you can come and get your soul say you want to come on a Monday you come on up here we'll put you in the water you want to come on Tuesday you come and you'll be baptized today that you hear my voice heart oh, not your heart he's standing at the door of your heart even now and he's knocking he wants to come in and fellowship with you he wants to come in and sup with you he wants to come in and make his abode with you but he can't do that with a person that won't be receptive of his word he cannot do that. God's word is not golden corral. You can't pick up what you want and put down what you don't want. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. You know as well as I know, hearse wheels are still rolling. Funeral homes ain't going out of business. Matter of fact, they got more business. But there's room at the cross. There's room at the cross for you, my brother and my sister. For those of you that have strayed away from God, there's room at the cross. For those of you that don't have a relationship with him, there is room for you at the cross. You've heard the word of God. My question to you now is, do you believe what you've heard? If you believe what it is that you've heard, now comes a time for you to repent of your sins. What does that mean? That means I'm going to make a mental decision that's going to show up in my actions. Amen. After repentance, you confess with your mouth, your mouth that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Yes. And that very confession brought death to him, yeah. but it will bring you life everlasting. Yes. After you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the son of God, be willing to be baptized for the remission of your sin. And can I tell you, that's the same way that they were saved in the New Testament scripture on the day of Pentecost. And we're still in the New Testament, am I correct? We moved to a new one, am I right? So the same thing that worked for them 
is going to work for us as well. So for those of you here today that may be subject to the invitation, for those of you that are here that may already be Christians, but you say, preacher, this man needs some work. Come down and let us pray for you on this morning. You don't have to walk around with your mind cluttered, with your mind filled with all kinds of thoughts, having to make all kinds of decisions. You got depression that you're dealing with. You got anxieties about decisions and things that you're having to go through. You don't have to deal with it by yourself. But God has come to bear the load for you. So if you're here today and you need to make a decision for Christ, I don't know. You know where you are with God and the decision that you need to make. Don't put off today for what you have intentions on doing at another time. Today that you hear his voice, harden not your heart. You can come to Jesus even now as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. I surrender.